distressful. One million suicides happen every year. This figure of one million means that <coughs> one suicide is happening every 40 seconds. I started this talk and already two suicides must have been committed by now. Uh, now there is so much concern in American colleges that there are gun shootings, there are love, vociferous protests to try to bring some restraint on the position of guns among people in general and potentially dangerous people. That's definitely a, a very important concern, but far more than the number of people who are killed by gunmen. Or to speak of gunmen alone, far more than the number of people who are killed in all violent crimes and even wars, even if there's no major war, far more than the number of people killed by others are the number of people who are killing themselves. So the World, uh, the World Health Organization calls this a tragic social health problem. A few years ago, I was at a UNESCO conference in India. And there, uh, the main topic of discussion was that how do we address this tragic social health problem where people are destroying themselves and we've not seen anything of this magnitude in the past. <coughs> yes, people have always been dying, but people killing themselves out of frustration, out of distress is unprecedented. So a few months ago I was in in IIT, which is the top college in India, and I gave some talks over there. So one of the leading professors, the head of department of the cryogenics department, came to meet me and he was talking about how there is an alarming problem of bright students ending their lives. And sometimes the solutions that are sought are tragically superficial. So some students in the IIT colleges, they, a series of students committed suicide by hanging themselves from the fan. And the solution that the IIT administration came up with was remove all fans from the hostel and put air conditioners. Mm -hmm. Now the fans are not making people do suicide. People will find some other way to do it if the fans are not there. So what is it that makes people act in this way? Viktor Frankl was a German psychiatrist, uh, German psychologist, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. And basically, he was a Nazi concentration camp survivor. He, was, he lived in unspeakable horrors, subjected to atrocities. And there he found that one by one by one people perished. But this was his conclusion after going through it all, surviving through it all. Life is not primarily a quest for pleasure or a quest for power, but a quest for meaning. The greatest task for any person is to find meaning is her, in, her, is her, in his or her life. What he found was that as a doctor he could observe how who was living, how healthy person was, how weak someone was. And yet he found that the people who survived in the concentration camps were not the people who were the healthiest or the fittest. He found those people survived who had some strong purpose. They wanted to do something in their life which they felt they had to do. And no matter how many difficulties came, they persevered through them all to fulfill that purpose. So, when we have a sense of meaning in life, what is life all about? That brings a sense of purpose. What am I meant to do? Meaning refers to the broad understanding of what is life all about. Purpose means how do I fit into the scheme of things. And when we have a purpose, then purpose provides power. We all face problems in life, but we can face problems if we know that they are meaningful. If we get caught 
at a place where there is no food and just by circumstance we are starving will be irritated even missing one meal or two meals uh, it's irritating if you're consciously fasting uh, for some purpose say we have to do some important medical test and that requires us to fast now in both cases the body is deprived of food but in one case just irritated why did i forget to take the food why did i get trapped over there in the other case also the body the sense of hunger is there but because the purpose is there we are able to tolerate what to speak of just tolerating problems if we have a sense of purpose we can even embrace problems when soldiers fight then they know that they are risking their lives but they have a sense of purpose when the twin towers were collapsing many firefighters risked their lives to enter into those towers to rescue people so if we have a sense of purpose we can rise far above our situations because we feel this problem is worthwhile imagine if you are studying for a exam and how many of you have situations where you are studying a subject which you don't like hmm? <laughs> everyone <laughs> so we all go through that and at that time if you don't like the subject it becomes very difficult to perceive in studying it now suppose that subject is a part of a curriculum a syllabus which is required for you to graduate in a degree which you want to get then for this degree i have to do this so you will study but suppose that subject say if you are science students and the subject is from humanities and you have no interest in humanities you are not going to go into humanities then you will find out why do i have to study this so the subject is the same but if studying that subject is serving a purpose then we feel yeah i can do it it's difficult but i'll do it but if studying that subject is serving no purpose why am i trapped here some people are very talkative just keep rambling and rambling and rambling now if you are with them maybe you're just looking at the watch when can i get out of here but suppose that person is important that person is your project guide then they may ramble but in between they may tell something important to you if you have a purpose over there then you will tolerate all the rambling so that you can get to what you want so life will send problems in the life in all of our lives but if there is a purpose then we can tolerate it sooner or later we do ask ourselves the question what is the point of it all we may not ask the question in terms of life itself but okay what is the point of it all i am in this college i am studying what is the point of it all you may have some goal in your life oh i want to become an engineer i want to become a doctor i want to have good career these are these are the goals that push us okay what does purpose do purpose gives us momentum now imagine if a vehicle is moving very slowly and then some pillar has fallen in between the way and the vehicle just come to a stop but if you have a big truck which is moving very fast and a pillar is in the way pillar comes the vehicle tack just throws the pillar aside and moves on so similarly for us if we have a strong sense of purpose then obstacles may come but we can persevere through those obstacles now all of us can have our subjective purposes okay yeah i want to do i want to become an engineer i want to become a doctor this is my go- purpose so that is fine we all need some purpose in our life but is there a objective meaning to life itself is there a objective purpose to life itself this question is important to ask because we live in an age of science and in science we want to know objective truth is it okay what is it actually subjectively each of us can have our purpose and that's fine we are individuals 
but does life itself have a purpose sometimes we may face say a situation in our lives where we have some purpose for our life but suddenly something happens and that purpose is shattered if somebody makes the purpose of their life say i want to become a surgeon and then somehow something happens and their hands lose functionality they can't do surgery so now they just can't fulfill that purpose so what do they do at that time so sometimes <coughs> circumstances may come such as when we set a objective purpose for our life that self purpose may not be fulfilled so to understand whether there is objective purpose for life let's see what science tells us the point which i'm going to draw towards is that why do we need spirituality in the age of science because science does not give us a sense of meaning and purpose and we need it and spirituality can provide us that so okay this is physicist we steven weinberg he said that would you even like to read this the more comprehensible the universe becomes the more it also seems pointless yeah now what does it mean thank you what does it mean pointless basically as we have studied the universe more and more what the world view that emerges from it is that okay how did everything come about you know everything came from some singularity which is basically like nothing so what it means is nothing existed because of nothing nothing exploded because of nothing and then give rise to everything no what is the point of our existence if we are just uh, biochemical somehow come alive then we are existing between two infinities of nothingness before birth and after death suddenly we are flapping around for some time and then we finish off what is the point of it all so now it's interesting steven winberg is saying this but can science actually tell us that there is no meaning the science magazine on its 125th anniversary issue uh, published a special feature called what we don't know what science doesn't know and there were 125 items that they gave that we don't know and the first among them was where what is the universe made of that means where is the where does the universe come from what is it made of and what where does consciousness come from so now where do, what is the universe made of the question comes up because according to current physics more than 95% of the universe is made of dark matter and dark energy so basically by perceiving the observable universe we have had to postulate something which is unobservable so what is the universe actually made of and consciousness is a profoundly mysterious phenomena because our hand is made essentially the same elements as this chair now or this mic now does this mic exist does it exist or does it exist it yeah obviously it exists it now if i ask you do you exist <laughs> obviously you know if i ask you this question do i exist you will probably ask the question does does your intelligence exist <laughs> why are you asking a question like that but why i'm asking this is see this exists but it does not know that it exists we exist and we know that we exist so what is the essential difference between this mic and us fundamentally speaking the mic is made of the same particles as we are made up of atoms molecules and the fundamental particles that make up atoms we are also made of the same things and yet we have consciousness so where does it come from so if we understand where the universe what, what the universe is made up of where it comes from that will give us a sense of meaning and if we understand who we are and what is our place in the universe that will give us a sense of purpose and these two are questions which science as of now does not have answers for now before we move forwards okay we might say that okay if science doesn't know some things then they, they are just unknowable but let's try to understand how science knows something why science can know what it knows suppose we were lost somewhere suppose you know we slept went to sleep one night and we woke up and we found ourselves in an entirely remote place 
couldn't make any head or say, where am I? And as we're looking around, we saw a paper flipping towards us, flying towards us, and it came and we picked it up, saw that paper has some writing on it, and that writing is in a language that we can understand. And it's not just a language, it has the information we need. Go this way, go this way, go this way, and you'll reach home. Now, we would naturally get the question, hey, where did this paper come from, and how is it in the language that I understand? Isn't it? So similarly, if we look at, we are born into this world, we, we wake up in this world and we observe the world. The Renaissance was a time when man metaphorically woke up and started observing the world to try to understand how it functions. So now nature, which is like a book, we could say there's a book. In fact, the early scientists considered that there are two books that, in fact, the divine spoke through two books. One is the book of scripture and the book of nature. So now if you consider nature to be like a book which contains some messages. So then nature follows laws. Science can function only because nature follows laws. Last year when I had uh, uh, gone to Cambridge University, I spoke on science and spirituality over there. So on the way we passed by, uh, we saw the tree where Newton saw the fruit falling. Now, it was Newton's brilliance that on seeing the fruit falling, he asked the question, what made the fruit fall? Imagine if, if instead of Newton, a monkey had been sitting there. If the monkey would have seen a fruit falling. What do you think it would have done? Ate it, Ate it and gone off, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> so, Newton, he asked, what made this fruit fall? That's his brilliance. And it's even more brilliant that he came up with the theory of gravity based on analyzing that. But at the same time, his question itself, what made the fruit fall? That implies an assumption. The assumption that things don't just happen by chance. There is some pattern, there is some order in nature and we try to discern that order. So what is that order? How can we discern it? First of before we go into those questions, why does the order exist at all? If all of nature were simply the result of unguided natural forces, then why should there be any order in it at all? Why shouldn't things happen by itself? Science functions with the assumption that there is order in nature. Without that assumption, we could not postulate any theory, we couldn't do any experiment, nothing could be done at all. There would be no science at all. Now first, there is nature follows laws. But secondly, if we consider not only are there laws, those laws can be expressed in the language of mathematics. Like I said, there's a message which comes flying towards us. It's written in the language that we understand. So what is this language of mathematics? Now if we consider many of the constructs in mathematics, they have no direct correlate in nature. For example, if you consider the imaginary number, square root of minus one. Now, it's the very name imaginary indicates that it has no correlate in the real world. And yet, this imaginary number, which is a construct of the human mind, is very useful in discerning nature. So why should nature work according to the laws of mathematics? When mathematics and many of the concepts in mathematics are simply, we could say, constructs of the human mind. And thirdly, we have minds that conceive mathematics in a way that we can understand the laws of nature. So if our minds were also the results of unguided natural processes, why should there be a correlation between the way nature works and the way our mind works? And not just a correlation, but a correlation of precise mathematical precision. Now, Nobel, uh, the Nobel laureate Eugene Wigner he wrote a, a paper, very celebrated paper on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. And he's, he, this is a quote, concluding quote from his paper. Would anyone like to read this? Yeah. The miracle of appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics 
is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Yeah, thank you. So now, the language of mathematics, so F is equal to G M1 M2 upon R square. That's the law of gravity. Now, okay, nature follows laws, that's one question. But why does nature follow laws of mathematical precision? Now, if you could say, why does nature follow these laws? We don't know that. As he says, it's a gift. It just exists in nature and we are able to tap it. So we neither understand it nor we deserve it. So the point which I'm drawing towards through all this is that science is essentially a quest for making sense of the world. Science itself is a quest for meaning. When Newton observed the fruit falling, okay, what made this fruit fall? When we observe the planets moving in a particular way, okay, what, what is happening actually? So we try to make sense of things in nature. And why are we able to make sense of things? New Albert Einstein said that, is, uh, is, uh, that the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. Meaning, why should a universe, if it is a result of unguided natural processes, be constructed in such a way that it can be understood by the human mind? So this indicates that when we pursue science also, we are looking for meaning. But unfortunately, what is happening? Before I go back ahead, we see that okay, why do fruits fall? That's because of the law of gravity. You know, why do objects in motion stay in motion? That's because of the law of uh, third law of uh, because of the laws of motion. Uh, we have explanations for many things in nature. Why did this happen like this? Why does this happen like this? Why does this happen like this? That's what we study and understand through nature, through science. But then we ask the question: why do I exist? That is no purpose. We just have come, come into existence by chance, we'll stay for some time and we'll die. Why does the universe exist? Oh, it has no purpose. So, various phenomena in the universe have a purpose, but the universe has no purpose. Purpose in the sense that there is an orderly pattern in the way things in the universe are happening, at least as science observes it. So, it's like we, sci the way science leads us to is that we find ourselves seeking islands of meaning while drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness. And okay, this makes sense, this makes sense, this makes sense, but life, it doesn't make sense. What's going on here? There's something wrong. If, if the falling of objects makes sense, then our own life should also be making sense. There must be some way to make sense. Normally, when science encounters a barrier to its exploring cap capacity, then it expands its scope to understand it. So now let's try to understand the scope of science. Why questions of meaning and purpose? Why does Steven Winneberg say that the universe appears pointless? So I, the, I quoted him, but then I quoted how the science is finding meaning in the universe. And that we are finding meaning is amazing. But why is it that we are not finding meaning about the big picture? So science uses a particular method called as, we could call it methodological naturalism. And it has a scope. Now if I use a fishing net and go for fishing. But if the fishing net has holes of one inch by one inch, then no matter how long I fish, I won't be able to catch fish that are smaller than one inch. If I use a black and white camera and no longer how long I click photos, I won't be able to see color in the picture. Every method has its purpose, has its strength and also it has its limitation. So when science operates, what it does is it looks for natural explanations for natural phenomena. That's how science works right now. And when it looks for natural explanations for natural phenomena, it leaves out 
anything beyond that. When science started functioning itself, at that time, the scientific way of looking at the world divided the world into what, was, what are called primary properties and secondary properties. So science considers the measurable aspects of the universe to be primary properties. So height, width, breadth, speed, mass, these are measurable properties. And this is what science focuses on. And by, by focusing on the measurable parameters in the universe, we can post phrase things in the language of mathematics, we can come up with equations, and we can understand and manipulate and change things. And science considers that which is non-measurable to be secondary properties. And those are not what we focus on in the study of science. Now suppose you know, a friend came back, suppose you stay uh, yeah, with somebody else in, in their room next to you. They say, oh, today I met a wonderful person. Oh, really? Tell me about him. Uh, five feet, two inches. What? Okay, okay. Tell me something more. Oh, yeah. Weighed so and so. Oh, really? Okay, what else? Now, when we talk about people, you know, if they have some, especially if they are very tall or very short, we may notice it. If they are very fat or very thin, we may notice it. But normally, when we talk, when we experience the world, we don't primarily experience the world in terms of measurable dimensions. So what science considers as primary properties are not what comprise our primary experience of the world. Isn't it? You know, if we go and eat some food, hmm, today a delicious food. Okay. How was the okay, what was the how was the food? He said, okay, you know, it was and you start telling a list of ingredients. You know, it had this much salt, this much sugar, this much oil. Okay, but what was the item? How was it? That's what you would like to know. So, so here we see a mismatch happening. What science considers as primary properties are not our primary experience in the world. Let's consider further what this implies. Now, medical science is at one level meant to free people from pain and provide them health. And we have phenomenal advancement in medical science now. And yet with all its advancement, can we have something like a painometer? How much pain are you in? Now, now X-ray can tell that, okay, you had a fracture, your hand is disaligned by this many degrees, your bone, that means you must be in a lot of pain. But whether there is pain or not, that is something which has to be subjectively experienced. We cannot have a painometer because pain is not a quantifiable experience. I may say there's a lot of pain, a little pain. But how do you put a measure on the pain? What unit do we use? Five, six, seven, eight, how do you call it? You can't do that. So pain is something which is a which is a vital human experience, not vital in the sense that we eagerly want it, but it is an indispensable human experience. It is a central part of our human experience. And medical science purpose is to free people from pain. One of the purposes. But there is no way we can measure pain. We may have some indirect inferences. Oh, yeah, this fracture, yeah, this disease, you must be in a lot of pain. But it's not a quantifiable measure. Now, I <coughs> recently gave a seminar in Stanford speaking about fear. Mm. I spoke there to talk about the missing self in the selfie. Mm. So, <laughs> so there, uh, as speaking about fear, one of we all have various fears, and throughout various centuries, people have had fears. So, while some fears have always been common, like fear of public speaking is always there, fear of death is there, but two fears have been added to the list of common fears in the 21st century. One fear is the fear of terrorists. And second fear is the fear of rejection. In, in traditional societies, people form relationship more or less based on some traditional social arrangements. Now everybody is in the marketplace for relationships. And most people have to seek out the relationships themselves. Are they rejected? If I, the fear that I may be rejected is an agonizing fear. Because it makes people feel 
that their own self worth is challenged now we feel if we are rejected we are unloved not only are we unloved we feel that we are unlovable and that can be devastating so now if say we want to develop a relationship with someone and now we want to know do they really care for us with all our scientific advancement can we make something like a love meter i put it in somebody's heart do you really love me or you don't <laughs> we can't do that why because we may be able to measure certain the uh, chemicals in the brain certain brain states but we love is a is the driving experience for life for all of us and yet that is a driving and defining experience is something which is beyond the scope of science to quantify to measure there can be things associated with love which science can analyze it can help us but love itself is something which can't be measured so the point of all this is not to minimize science in any way it is just to contextualize what science offers every method has its focus and when when we focus goes on one thing it immediately goes off other things right now if you are focusing on the class then if somebody is doing something behind you will not notice it so much so the so the the spectacles that science uses for looking at nature focuses on the measurable parameters in nature and this focus takes us off the non measurable parameters and the result of this is that by focusing on external parameters we have been able to achieve external control at a phenomenal level but at an internal level our own emotions our own inner life has become mismanaged and we are unable to deal with it so we need a broader way of looking at things so the spiritual traditions of india the yoga texts like the bhagavad gita offer us a holistic model of the self and it says we have our existence is three dimensional the body mind and soul so if you compare it to software system the hardware the software and the user these three are together and currently scientific advancement is primarily about improving the hardware and we phenomenally improved the hardware but if the software is corrupted then the hardware is not of much use that we just no use on. and that's why we have some people in uh, in say in the, in the western world often if some farmers in india commit suicide it's it's highlighted oh people are so poor and so people are committing suicide because of that which is true it's sad anybody committing suicide is very tragic but at the same time the suicide capital of india is not the heartland of vidarbha where there are farmers the suicide capital of india is bangalore which is the software headquarters of india and a large part of the world so why is this there is that means that the improvement of the hardware in bangalore we have phenomenal facilities and there is lot of progress in the rural heartland there is not much progress but yet people are afflicted so much that the improved hardware is not offering them relief so there is corruption at the level of the software now i would like to do a thought exercise to illustrate this example of the body mind and the soul so you can sit relaxed in wherever you are sitting and a three steps exercise this is so you can close your eyes now and you can take with me three deep breaths one two three now with your eyes closed try to look ahead of you because your eyes are closed you cannot see whatever is physically in front of you but still you will see something you may see this room or if you are tired you may see your room and your bed 
if you are hungry you may see food you may see a friend a loved one you may see a sports match that you have seen a movie you have seen recently you may see various images coming and going on in an, on an inner screen or you may see just a dull pattern of color on that screen now whatever you see try to there is a inner screen which you are seeing and there is you who are seeing the inner screen now try to take a step back and look at who is looking at that inner screen take a step back and try to look at the inner seer of the inner screen try once again take a step back and try to see the inner seer and no matter how many times you step back the inner seer steps back with you what you are looking for is what you are looking with the inner seer is you the soul the inner screen is the mind you can take one deep breath and then you can open your eyes thank you you can open your eyes now so normally our perception happens when the outer scene the inner screen and the inner seer are in one line so right now if you are looking at me and this inner screen acts like a window on which whatever is outside gets projected and then you can see but if instead on that inner screen something else suddenly appears you have that inner screen it appears oh you know you have to do this work and you forgot to do it what will i do now then at that time the inner screen changes into a tv and it takes our consciousness somewhere else and that's how we become absent minded actually when you say it's absent minded the mind is not absent rather the mind is very much active and we are active with the mind but the mind is not present where the body is present that's why sometimes how many of you have had this experience that you are talking with someone and then suddenly you feel that person is not there only you had that experience you know yeah and you can get irritated here hey, what are you doing or sometimes this i we may say earth to you come back come back you know where have you gone <laughs> have you gone to some other planet so what happens is that this inner screen is what we respond to we don't respond to the outer scene primarily we respond to the inner scene inner screen now if there is no proper correspondence between the outer scene and the inner screen then there is mismatch so this mismatch can happen in various ways when we focus primarily on physical things i want to get this i want to achieve this i want to do that and our consciousness gets too invested in physical reality i was talking with a student a few months ago and he was he told me that he's a cricket fan so a few maybe 6 7 months ago something there was a champions trophy final india and pakistan is like a match is like a world war so at that time in this india pakistan match india was expected to win this champions trophy final and india lost and lost very badly so he told me after that for three nights i could not sleep i told him you know players went to sleep why couldn't you sleep <laughs> so what happened for him was that he was in india that cricket tournament happened in england but he on his inner screen 
that match was being replayed again and again. Why did he play a shot like this? Why did he drop that catch? Why did this a ball like this? Why? 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 And then he was not able to function at all. He couldn't function in the day, he couldn't function at night and sleep. So when this inner screen starts replaying something which is unwanted, then we can't function. We're just replaying, okay, a, a, a cricket match, it might just seem humorous or frivolous. But the inner world, the inner screen can sometimes replay things which are dangerous also. How many of you have experienced worry? <laughs> Isn't it? Every one of us. Now, when we worry, what happens actually? Anxiety is considered one of the biggest mental health problems. Now, if anxiety is untreated, it eventually leads to people committing suicide. So, what actually happens when we commit, when we suffer anxiety? Actually, on the inner screen, instead of the present appearing, the future starts appearing. And all kinds of scary scenarios start coming. This may go wrong, that may go wrong, that may go wrong. Worry is like the interest we pay on loans that we haven't yet taken. <laughs> Those problems have not occurred early and they may never occur. Uh, no matter how difficult the situation is, say somebody has a relationship and they experience rejection in the relationship. Now that is not a reason to commit suicide. But what happens? They think, oh, I was rejected by this person. I was rejected by someone else also. I'll be rejected by someone else also. I'll be unloved. I'll be lonely. My life will be so miserable. Oh, let me commit suicide. So when the inner screen starts going off into the future, that leads to anxiety. The second major mental health problem that people face today is depression. How many of you have been gone through phases when you have been depressed? Yeah, all of us. Thank you. Now, why does this happen? During depression, the inner screen starts replaying the past. So, oh, you know, this. I tried to do this but it didn't work out. I did that, but that went wrong. I did that, that went wrong. And when it starts replaying again and again, all the bad things that have happened in the past, we start getting disempowered. We start getting de-energized. And we start feeling, this what has happened in the past is what is going to happen to me in the future also. And in that way, we lose our morale. So managing what appears on our inner screen is extremely important. And it is what appears on the inner screen which determines whether our life has meaning, whether our life has purpose. Somebody may have oh, the best computer, they have the best internet connection. But if they, if say negative images are playing on the inner screen, causing anxiety or depression, they will use the best internet connection to search fastest. No. What is the easiest way to commit suicide? That is, that is one of the higher Google search items. You know. People search. How, how can I commit suicide? So then what is happening here? The technology is there, but the technology, rather than helping, it harms. Why does it harm? Because on the inner screen, unwanted things are playing. So for us, we need to make sure that our inner screen is displaying things that are healthy and helpful for us. And unfortunately, through the technological progress, science ultimately doesn't give us any ultimate sense of meaning. On the other hand, it gives us so many stimuli through technology that we can get more and more distracted. And thus, our sense of meaning and meaning on purpose can get completely lost. Oh, this is happening here, that is happening here, that is happening there. Nothing is going to work for me. So, just as I talked about this hardware, software and the user. So, if the software gets corrupted by a virus, it can't function. Similarly, our mind can get corrupted. Now, I said the virus, the mind, 
when it gets corrupted wrong images start coming and the cause of these unwanted images coming is that the virus that infects the mind is that the idea that the physical alone is real and will provide real happiness when say we are getting depressed or when we are getting worried what exactly is happening some things have not worked out at the physical level or some things we fear may not work out at the physical level and that is causing us anxiety but actually we are not that physical reality we are distinct from it when people have a sense of purpose say for example somebody a warrior is fighting a war okay physical i talked earlier about when there is the inner sphere the inner screen and the outer scene so like you are i am looking at you hmm? so you are the physical reality and you are if i am attentive then you will appear on my inner screen so that will be the mental reality what appears over there but if my mind is misfiring then what happens is the physical reality uh, may keep replaying even after it has happened and that will cause me to misperceive things so physical reality means basically like i said the external world hmm? the external world that is out there bad things happen in that world but today's problems are always manageable today however when the inner screen starts misfiring then on top of today's problems we add yesterday's problems and tomorrow's problems and then life becomes unbearable if i have to lift a 10 kg weight i can do it but if i have to lift 10 10 kg suitcases i'll get crushed so similarly for us when the inner screen starts focusing or displaying not just what is happening at the physical level right now but something else that happened in the past something that may happen in the future when our consciousness gets completely riveted to the physical reality alone then it tends to misfire and that's how uh, we get misled so we need to be able to manage the things that appear on the inner screen and that is where spirituality comes into the picture spirituality gives us the understanding that we are not the inner screen what is happening on the inner screen is not what is real so yes something may some problems may come in the future they may not come in the future let me focus on what i can do right now so when we learn to focus in this way to, so for example in spirituality we have the practice of meditation meditation can be done in various different ways we chant we do mantra meditation we chant mantras now what mantras are meant to do is that they are meant to take our consciousness from the physical level to the spiritual level that means oh this problem is here this problem is here this problem is here yes the problems are there but i am not those problems oh i am th- worried about this i am worried about this i am worried about this yes but i am not my thoughts i am the thinker of my thoughts i am not my feelings i am the feeler of my feelings the bhagavad gita in its 14th chapter asks us to become an observer of our emotions so this capacity to become uh, the observer of the outer world and the observer of the inner world is increased by our spiritual knowledge and by our spiritual practice when we thus bring spirituality into our life then we can distance ourselves from the physical and the mental and situate ourselves in spiritual self understanding and that understanding brings security now somebody may say you know who knows whether the spiritual business is real or not i don't know uh, yes it's true it may be real it may not be real but as i discussed earlier at the physical level we are never going to find meaning we are never going to find purpose what is our primary experience of life in terms of emotions in terms of love this is not going to be found at the physical level so there is some experience that we have and we need an explanation for that experience so why not look for that explanation wherever we get it uh, at the start of the 20th century uh, lord kelvin had said famously that uh, for the future generations of science physicists the biggest challenge is going to be unemployment because uh, all the physical world has been explained and they have nothing to do that's what they thought 
because Newtonian classical physics was working so well. But there were some small shadows on this horizon. And this black body radiation was not being explained. And then from those shadows, they turned out to be storms which are approaching. And the whole foundation of physics changed. And then now we have quantum physics to explain the fundamental particles level of reality. And then we have relativity physics to explain the macroscopic level of reality. So the point is that Newtonian physics worked very well at the normal level of experience. But when we stretch to microscopic or macroscopic, it didn't work. Similarly, living at the physical level of reality may work in our day-to-day -day life for normal occurrences. But when we are stretched, when life gives us problems, at that time, living at the physical level will subject us to enormous distress. We need to rise to a higher level. And if we do that, we will experience some security. I'll conclude with one last experience, which will lead to the conclusion of this talk. So <clears throat> last year when I had come to America, I was in Florida. At that time, the Hurricane Irma hit Florida. So I knew it was coming. So I came to the West Coast. I came to New York. You just see that area for giving some classes and meeting some people. One of my friends was in Florida on a writing retreat. And in order to focus, he just cut off from everything else. And one morning he woke up, came to the window, and saw everything was flooded. Hell, he was happening. And he tried to turn on, uh, turn on his internet, he had cut that off also. And he said that the internet was not working. He tried to call someone, he found the phone was not working. Then as he was looking around, the power went off. And then he could see, it was daytime, so he could see the water level was rising, rising, rising. He was panicky. He was just staying in another, another acquaintance's house and he had just been focusing on the writing. He started looking around, what to do, where to go? There was no way to go. And as he was peering around, suddenly he saw behind a closet, there appeared to be something like a door. So he pulled the closet aside and he found there was a door. He opened the door and there was a small stairway that led to the attic. He went to the attic and there he stayed safe. For several hours the water rose, 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 rose upwards. But it inundated the ground level. However, in the first level he was safe. Then the hurricane receded, the hurricane passed away, the water level receded and he was rescued. So similarly for us, now normally he was just living at the ground level, he didn't even know the first level existed. So the ground level is like the physical level of reality. The first level is the spiritual level of reality. Normally we live only at the ground level. But sometimes problems start coming and the problems can be so overwhelming that this is no solution seen at the ground level. So we have to rise to a higher level. We are very fortunate if we can understand that there is a higher level and we find a pathway to get to that higher level. So spiritual knowledge tells us that our life has a higher side also. And spiritual practices are like the stairway by which you can rise to that higher level. And when we do that, we can experience peace even amidst distress. If we become spiritually situated, then life's distresses may come, but we won't be shaken by them. Because we will be situated in inner security. And it's not a con just a conception. When we talk about meaning and purpose, uh, the spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom tells us that we are on a journey of spiritual evolution. We are souls who are meant who are meant to expand our consciousness to the spiritual level, and we are seeking enduring meaning. Our life is not a hundred meter sprint, we succeed or we fail. It's a hundred mile marathon, and even if we fall back in one lap. In life, it doesn't matter. It's a long journey and we can catch up. So when we get this long-term perspective, then if things go wrong at the physical level, we are not that affected by it. We can move forwards. Even if a specific purpose doesn't work out, we understand our purpose of growing in knowledge, growing in wisdom, growing in love. We are parts of an infinite whole. 
and finite consciousness and infinite consciousness meant to be bonded in eternal love and that bond is the ultimate purpose of life so when we understand this long term purpose then we can actually face life's problems without getting overwhelmed by them this long term purpose gives a momentum to our life when obstacles come at that time instead of the obstacle simply replaying in our mind and causing agitation causing frustration leading to self destruction instead we will raise ourselves upwards okay i faced many problems like this in the past i have weathered them i'll weather this also with that understanding when we move forwards with our, the universe has a purpose our life has a purpose that is our spiritual evolution and whatever we do in life that is all meant to contribute not just at the phys physical level of reality to the results that we get it's also meant to contribute to our inner evolution and in this way this higher purpose and meaning can give us power in our lives so to conclude science can make things in the outer world better but spirituality can make people better it can help us to manage our emotions better it can infuse our life with a greater meaning and purpose and thus it can bring supreme positivity in our life so i'll summarize what i spoke today i started by speaking about uh, why do we need science, spirituality in the age of science said that science we, we all need meaning i talked about dr victor frankl who was uh, <clears throat> who was trapped in the holocaust in the concentration camps and he found that the people who survived were not just the people who were the fittest but the people who had the strongest sense of purpose so we see today there is extraordinary progress but also extraordinary distress more the number of people who are being killed by gunmen are the people who are killing themselves much much more why is this happening because we don't have a sense of meaning and purpose when problems come if what is the point of life so where do we get the sense of meaning and purpose if we look at the <coughs> primary source of knowledge today which is science then uh, we have scientists telling us even when works at the universe looks pointless now why why does he think like that actually speaking science itself is a search for meaning when newton saw the fruit fall and he asked what made this fruit fall that means he was assuming that there is order in nature and we are trying to make sense of why things happen making sense is basically looking for meaning so now the fact that science is able to find make some sense of the universe itself is astonishing it's like i am lost and i i find a paper flying towards me which has text written in a language that i understand which contains the informa- conveys the information that i need so similarly if everything were a result of unguided natural processes why should nature follow laws why should those laws be in a language of mathematics which many of its whose constructs are simply constructs of our mind and why should our mind be able to have the ability of coming up with mathematics which reflect the way nature works so i quoted eugenian wigner and uh, albert einstein the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible so the fact is that we have found meaning in some aspects of the universe and yet the scientific world view says that ultimately we exist for nothing so what's wrong it's like we have found islets of meaning but we are drowning in an ocean of meaninglessness so could it be that the problem is not that there is no meaning but the methodology may not be appropriate i talk about science uses methodological naturalism that means it looks for natural explanations for natural phenomena like uh, so with a fishing net we can catch only fish that are smaller than its size with a black and white camera we can see only black and white pictures not color so science what is what is science look for science at its start in order to be able to control nature divided the universe into primary and secondary properties primary are those which are measurable and that's how we came up with mathematics as a language for oper- understanding but in our experience the primary experience is not of measurable qualities it is of colors emotions and experiences that are rich in their variety so with all the scientific progress we cannot have a penometer or a lavometer but these are what our primary experiences are so if the world that we experience is not explained by science 
then let us be open to see where we can get the explanation for the world that we experience. So uh, we could discuss one possible explanation is from the yoga texts of India, which give us a three level model of the self, the body, mind and soul, which is like the hardware, software and user. And to conceive this, we did the thought experiment that we can see the inner screen, but not the inner seer. Uh, the inner seer is who is seeing, that is we, the soul, the inner screen is the mind. And why is there so much mental distress today? Because on the inner screen, lots of unwanted images are coming. So when the inner screen repeatedly displays dire scenarios about the future, we get anxiety, disorders. When it displays repeatedly the negative scenarios of the past, we get depression. Now, oh, with all of our scientific, technologies uh, scientific technology and its advancement, we actually get more and more inputs on the inner screen and they cause more and more distraction. So for us to manage ourselves better, we need to be able to control what appears on the inner screen. And that happens when we understand that I am not the inner screen, that I have a self-identity and self-security beyond the inner screen. That understanding comes by spiritual knowledge and spiritual practice. So just as this uh, friend who was trapped in the flood and found that he could get rescued, find safety at upper level. Similarly, in a normal level of living, we may be satisfied at the physical level of reality. But when distresses come, we need the spiritual level. And just as science, only because it expanded its scope, it could explain normal human experience, normal, ex normal observable, measurable realities. But the, for the subatomic and uh, macroscopic, it needed other developments, quantum physics and relativity. Similarly, for, explain, for finding meaning beyond our day-to-day -day routine activities, we need to expand our knowledge sources, not just science, but also spirituality. And science can help us make things better in the outer world. Spirituality can make us better in our inner world. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Okay. <laughs> what happens to people who refuse to rise up to the spiritual level? So basically the question, I mean, what I had in mind is, I, uh, I have a spiritual belief and my own system, rather whatever I've read or whatever I've seen. So that has helped me be what I am and, you know, in whatever situation that I face. But there are people who just don't acknowledge this okay. level. So okay. How do they succeed in life? Or okay. How do yeah. And how yeah, I get your question. So there are people who have no interest in spirituality. How do they face life's problems? Yeah. Yes, what appears on our inner screen <coughs> is determined by various factors. It is determined by our upbringing, it is determined by our association. And to a significant extent, it is determined by our past karma. The soul is on a multi-life journey of spiritual evolution. And many of, and when the soul goes from one body to another, the mind also goes with it. So the impressions that are formed in the mind, or the what pops up on the mind, what inclinations the mind has, that is also shaped by one's previous life. So some people may have positive impressions from their spiritual previous life. And if they have positive impressions, we could say that means they have good karma from their previous life, then they may not get so distracted or agitated. So we are not saying that if somebody is not spiritual, they cannot be good people. We, cannot say, we are not saying that somebody is not spiritual, they cannot be successful. But the fact is that even if one is not spiritual, if one is able to <clears throat> one doesn't have too many distracting tendencies within one's mind, then one will be able to function in this life. But what about ultimate meaning? What about ultimate purpose? Live at the physical level and then lose everything at the physical level at the time of death. And even before that, there are times where people experience envy. Just get 
they get disheartened. What am I doing? Especially when some big loss happens in their life, they lose a loved one, or they lose a cherished job, or they face a serious health crisis at that time. What am I living for? So we don't have to experience disruption at the physical level to seek elevation to the spiritual level. Mm -hmm. We can do it with proactivity, by, with intelligence and positive purpose. So, so at one level, spiritual knowledge will help us to better uh, face life at the physical level. And even those who are facing it well, if they had spiritual knowledge, they would be able to face it even better. They would be able to do even better. But ultimately, spiritual knowledge is not just meant to be a shock absorber for living at the physical level of reality. And this will help you to face problems better. It's not just meant for that. Ultimately, spiritual knowledge is meant to be a goal transformer. It is meant to give us a higher purpose to life. And those who are not living spiritually, they will not evolve. They will not, on their multi-life journey, they will not evolve, but they will devolve. They will go to a level, lower level of consciousness. Okay? okay. So you mentioned that soul is on a, a journey with a multi-life yeah, multi multi journey. So, um, what is the origin and what is the termination? Okay. If the soul is on a multi-life journey, what is the origin and what is the termination? The origin is that we all are parts of the infinite. And we all have been given free will. And free will means we have, we have to be given the potential to use it or to misuse it. Hmm? There cannot be force. So for example, if a, a boy proposes to a girl, he kneels down in front of her, offers her a ring and says, please marry me. And she says, no. Immediately takes out a gun, marry me. <laughs> <laughs> now, that would not be love, isn't it? <laughs> so, there is the infinite consciousness, supreme, and we are the parts. So we have been given free will. Although the infinite is all powerful, our free will is not taken away. So we can choose to love the infinite or we can choose to explore life in alternative ways. So we, the souls who are here right now, we are exploring life in alternative ways. So the origin of our existence is, our, is, the, is the eagerness or the, we could say the daredevilishness to try to experience life separate from the Supreme. And the purpose of this multi-life evolution is to be reunited with the infinite. Uh, so we explore different options in life, and as we explore different options, say, okay, this doesn't give me happiness. This doesn't. This doesn't give me happiness. This doesn't give me happiness. What will actually make me happy? As we explore this, eventually, we uh, turn towards spiritual reality, and that is where we experience the super ultimate happiness. Okay, and that is where our multi-life journey will end. So when I talk about spiritual evolution means evolution in our understanding of what is the best source of happiness. So is it something like uh, we are part of some higher energy and then we are sent down and the ultimate goal is to Yeah, we are a part of a higher energy, higher, it's not an energy, there is an energetic person also. That there is personal and impersonal, both aspects are there. It's like the sun and the sunlight. But so similarly, there is a person and there's an impersonal light. Impersonal, both of them are there. So the important thing is that uh, we are all uh, having the free will to explore. And this exploration is meant to lead to evolution. So if our exploration moves forward, it's like I choose this option, this option, this option, this doesn't work. If I have multiple choice question, and okay, this is the wrong answer, this is the wrong answer, this is the wrong answer, this is the right answer. So we can, with our intelligence, choose the right answer or we can keep exploring all the wrong alternatives and then come to the right alternative. But that option is there for us. So life is, you could say, like a multiple choice exam in which we are meant to make the right choices. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, you spoke about uh, controlling what appears on the inner screen, right? Uh, could, you, could you give us some tips as to how you recognize the negative shift in your inner screen and then make that transition? That okay. Yeah. Very mi minimal time, because at that point we will not be in a state to meditate. Correct. Okay. Aware, right? How do you recognize that? 
Okay, so if something negative starts appearing on the screen, how do we uh, recognize that yeah. and rectify Eventually that? You get yeah, away I and understand. Time is lost. So generally, uh, in the heat of the movement, it is very difficult to recognize that. But if we are self-observant, later on we can understand. Okay, at that time this happened, and I did this. So it's a, suppose we are driving on a road, and suddenly we hit a bump. We didn't know there was a bump and there was no mark. Suddenly we hit it. Next time when we go on the road, we'll be cautious. Oh, I don't know. We'll slow down or we'll move from the other road. Something like that. There's a pothole, we'll move on the other side. So similarly, when say if we became overcome by overcame by anxiety, or we started getting depressed, or we started getting angry. At that time we just do something in the heat of the moment. But afterwards look back, what exactly happened? Oh, I was here, I was doing this. And suddenly this thought came in my mind. And from that thought this started, this started, this started. Oh, you know, at that time, if I had stopped that thought. So generally speaking, uh, one way to distance ourselves is that instead of thinking, okay, I am feeling angry. That comes in, uh, my mind is saying, you are feeling angry. Just rephrase what is happening. I'm worried. My mind is saying you are worried. So if say instead of the thought of worry coming inside us, if somebody else came and started scaring us, you know, you know, if you don't pass in your exam, you will not get a job. If you don't get a job, how will you pay your how will you pay your repay your loan? What will happen to you? What face will you show to others? Hey, stop scaring me. Stop talking so negative. If somebody else started doing the same thing, we would not just passively accept whatever they are saying. We would evaluate it and we would protect ourselves from the negativity. So similarly, if we catch, okay, this was the time this happened. And then understand, this was the time that the mind gave me this thought and I accepted it. So then, next time when something similar happens, we will be more prepared to catch it. It will take time. For a moment, we, will be, we may fuse with our thoughts also. But if we practice, and this practice is not just an intellectual exercise, it has to be a spiritual exercise. At that time, we may not be able to meditate. But if we are meditating regularly, if we are, if we are raising ourselves to spiritual consciousness by chanting mantras regularly, then we will have the alertness. Oh, I am fusing with my thoughts. It's like a firefighter who is new and a firefighter who is experienced. When they see a big fire, both of them may have moments of panic. But for the new firefighter, it's petrified. But for the seasoned firefighter, the years of training and practice kicks into action. Oh, okay, let's attack the fire from this side. Pour the water over here. Call more reinforcement. It'll spring into action. So like that, the fusion of our, ourselves with our thoughts will happen for some time. But if we have been practicing spirituality, then our spiritual instincts will kick in. Oh, I don't need to do this. We will be able to catch ourselves earlier and earlier. So sometimes we'll at least we should catch ourselves after it happened. Not just beat yourself. Why did I do that? But understand. Oh, the mind prompted me and that's why I did that. At what point did the mind prompt me? And what could I have done at that time? One easy way to start managing our emotions is deep breathing. Just take deep breaths. The, what happens is the breathing is very connected with the mind. So when the mind starts getting agitated, it starts giving different images. So ideally to become, to protect ourselves from the mind, the, the various wrong images that are coming on the mind, we need to rise to the spiritual level. But rising to the spiritual level takes time and it takes practice. But if at that time we can just come down to a specific physical aspect. Our mind is worried, oh this will go wrong, that will go wrong, that will go wrong, that will go wrong. No, just bring that consciousness down to the physical level. Breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. And try to focus the consciousness on breathing. By this what happens? The train of thoughts which is going towards the station of panic. The train of thoughts which is going towards the station of depression. That train of thought gets interrupted. 
because it's going in that direction, I suddenly become conscious of my breath. When we start becoming seasoned practitioners of say mantra meditation, then reflexively we will chant the mantra. And the mantra will become the interrupter of that train of thoughts. So basically, we have to find out which tool works best for us to interrupt the mind's train of thoughts. And by doing this, we will be able to distance ourselves. Does that answer your question? Thank you. You had a question? Yeah. Yeah. So, actually, my friend was gonna be here, but somehow she got stuck up in some errands. So, on behalf of her, I would like to ask this because I had debate with her on the same issue. So, she once told me because she is from bioinformatics. She told me that uh, scientists have like uh, started incubating uh, like animals in their lab, like. They, they take seed from a male and then fertilize it with the egg from the female and they, then they uh, incubate it in an mm. artificial womb in the lab. Okay. But how do scientists explain the source of consciousness? Okay. And how does the soul enter that body? Because they can't see it, so I mean, how do they explain it? Okay, good question. So if incubation is being done externally, then if you're taking a <coughs> say the egg from the female, the sperm from the male and uniting it, uh, then where does the soul come into the picture? That way we can ask where does the soul come into picture in normal reproduction also, isn't it? Normal reproduction again the soul, the man and a woman unite. So the point here is the soul cannot be pursued at the physical level. But the soul's presence itself leads to some significantly different characteristics manifesting in matter. I earlier talked about how this mic and the hand, what is the difference between the two? I said, this is not aware of its existence, this is aware of its existence. But another way to look at it is that matter normally undergoes three states. There is creation, there is deterioration and there is destruction. Now, this table was built if somebody bangs it, it will break. Then afterwards, it will break down completely. On the other hand, if respect us conscious beings, we go through not uh, living beings go through not three but six changes. After we are created, we grow. We can't have no matter how sophisticated a computer we have, the computer is not going to grow, is it? Then we maintain ourselves. If my hand gets cut, it clots and heals itself. Homeostasis is a whole process in the body. It try to protect itself. There is no, no such thing in, in we could say, uh, normal matter. Then, then another is reproduction. We reproduce. So, with all our scientific advancement, we don't know why some matter goes through these six changes and why some matter goes through these three changes. What is it that is different? From our visible perspective, this matter and this matter are made of the same components. Mm -hmm. So, it's, so the, uh, it's not the process of reproduction that is important. It is the principle that is there which is different over there. So yes, uh, the, uh, sometimes the reproduction can happen in through normal means. Sometimes the reproduction can happen through nor non-normal means. In fact, in many of the Vedic texts also, it described at times uh, uh, how the sperm would be taken from a sage and that somebody else would take that sperm and preserve that sperm and from that some new person would come up. So that's not a... What is advanced in this is the technology. As earlier we may not have the technology by which we could incubate outside. But no matter how much we develop the technology, the point here is, what is the principle? Why is it that this matter is behaving this way and this matter is behaving this way? So, now, now with respect to the specific question of where the soul is present, actually the soul, one of the characters of the soul described in the Bhagavad Gita is that it is Sarvagataha. Mm -hmm. It is capable of being present everywhere. In our own bodies, more than the number of cells in our body, several times more are the number of germs that are present in our body. Now, uh, by germs, I don't mean negative germs, but just microbes. And they are needed for the functioning of this body. 
So now each of those microbes is a soul. So basically, souls are present at various places, and wherever they get a suitable biological medium to become embodied, they take that mode medium. So nature may create that biological medium in the womb, or we may create that bi biological medium using technology in an external lab. That doesn't matter. What matters is that this matter. The, what matters is that the certain we could say biological matter, actually matter is that embodied matter or so, or matter that is living that exhibits fundamentally different characteristics from matter that is non-living. And why that difference is there? That is something which has no material explanation. So that is because there is something higher present which animates. Okay. Any other questions? So I have one yeah, more. sure. So, um, like, if like, I'm not talking about all the scientists in general, but some scientists, if God exists, why don't they believe in them? And the uh, will science and spirituality converge at some point? And the scientists, do they have to rise up to the spiritual level to understand God, or is God quantifiable? Okay, good question. So why? Uh, why do scientists not accept God? Can science and spirituality converge in the sense that scientists will understand God one day or God uh, will God become quantifiable? Okay. The word science originally meant knowledge, to know. Like we have omniscience. They also had the word science. So to know everything. That's omniscience as an attribute of God. Now when Newton postulated the laws of gravity, he did not call himself a scientist. It was his principle, a natural philosophy. He was an, he considered himself a natural philosopher. The word scientist itself, as we use it, and science as we use it, is an 18th century invention, 18th, uh, 18, around 18th century. So the word science itself is used in a particular sense today. That we look for natural explanations for natural phenomena. Now, as long as we are looking for natural explanations for natural phenomena, what to speak of science understanding God, science cannot even understand our own emotions. You may find that, okay, these emotions are associated <coughs> with this area of the brain, but that's all. Beyond that, how, how, do, how do these emotions come over there? So, what can happen is that science itself expands its methodology. The quantum physics has led to the postulation at least that consciousness is a fundamental reality. Because much in quantum physics is observer specific. The waves of quantum physics, they collapse when there's an observer observing, and that's how we see objects. So I won't go into the technicalities of quantum physics over here. But to the extent, extent science can, integ can expand to include consciousness as a fundamental component of reality. And then it starts exploring consciousness on its own terms. Not as consciousness is manifested in matter. That means exploring brain states is one thing, but exploring conscious experience itself, that's another thing. So, spirituality itself can be called science, in the sense that, uh, that there is a well-defined, repeatable and verifiable methodology. So uh, now, in science there is theory, and there is experiment. In spirituality, there's philosophy and there's practice. So the philosophy aspect in science in spirituality, like the theory aspect in science. So philosophy says there's a part there's a spark of consciousness. There is um, infinite consciousness. These are all postulates. In now the practice the, the, the experiments are what enable us to very prove or disprove the theory. Similarly, the practices are meant to give us higher realization. Now, um, can God be uh, quantified? God, by definition, is spiritual. So, at a material level, he is not manifest. So, we cannot mathematically quantify him. The, the idea is that, as I told earlier, this world is given for us to explore our free will. So, if in this world, God were a 
the the existence of God, where ob God were an observable feature or a logically necessary proposition, then we would not have free will because we'd be forced to choose that. So actually, but if we, even now we can make that inference. Suppose we have somebody managing a particular system. Now, say if you are later on get a job in a computer uh, uh, company and you make a software, and that software works perfectly. It works so perfectly that you never need to call customer care. You enter the data, it processes right, processes it right, right, right. Now, for somebody who who has been using that, who, who comes to that uh, or come that plant where the software has been used for a long time, they may come and start using the software. And they put this data, this they get this result. They put this data, they get this result. They do this, they get this result. It becomes so predictable for them, they take it for granted. And they realize the software is always there. And nobody needs to manage it, nobody needs to maintain it, it's just working automatically. Now, a, a naive person would say, oh, the software is just there and it's working there. But a perceptive person would think, this software, if it is working so flawlessly, without needing any, needing any maintenance, that means it must have been made by a masterly programmer. The brilliance of the programmer can be seen by how little the programmer is required after the program is made. Isn't it? Similarly, nature has been made by God to be causally complete. And somebody who is naive may say, okay, this just exists. See, all systems have thought have to begin with some starting assumption. So atheism or non-theism, you could say, it begins with the starting assumption that the universe exists with its laws of nature. Now we can ask the question, why should the laws of nature be there at all? Why should insentient matter behave according to laws that to understand require a high level of sentience. So theism holds at the starting point that this program didn't just come by itself. It's working so well that it does not require any maintenance. But that indicates its brilliance. The brilliance of its maker. So therefore, uh, the, we, we will not perceive God at the physical level. Because God is by definition non-physical. It's like asking, you know, how much do I have to develop my hearing ability to smell a gulab jamun? <laughs> no matter how much my hearing ability develops, the methodology is not right for the object to be perceived. Similarly, material progress won't lead us to perceive God as a quantifiable reality. But at the same time, for an observer, for an astute observer, the, the, the causal completeness of material nature itself can point to God. Just like an excellent program which requires no intervention points to the brilliant programmer. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Do we have time? Okay. Yes, please. I have one more question. Yeah. Uh, the Reiki system of meditation and he healing focuses on the seven chakras. Mm. So when you sp spoke about transcending to the next level, uh, could you map this concept to that, that and say that you're try, trying to move all the energy of all the six chakras to the highest one? Okay. If that happens, then you exit the body, right? Okay. So how do you differentiate between death and that? Okay. So in the Reiki system, there are seven chakras and we try to raise our consciousness, our energy to the highest chakra. And then when the energy reaches that chakra, then what happens exactly? Is it death or something higher? Basically, the subtle level of reality is physical. I tell, so there's physical reality, there's spiritual reality, and there is subtle material reality. It's called the psychological or mental level of reality. So the subtle reality has been mapped in different schools of thought in different ways, and these are all models of reality. It's like in quantum physics, there's a model of reality. In classical physics, there's a model of reality. I call it in quantum physics, the stable doesn't exist. All that exists is waves. But when I as an observer look at this table, then the wave function collapses and the appearance of a table comes. So now Einstein just did not like this idea at all. He 
he wrote a letter to Neil Bohr, who was a prominent proponent of quantum physics, said that I would like to believe that the moon continues to exist even when I am not looking at it. <laughs> but according to quantum theory, it doesn't exist. So what, what I mean by this is that the, the model of quantum physics just doesn't make sense to our ordinary way of thinking. But it's a model which in terms of mathematical logic works. So different now exactly how the model of quantum physics maps onto the world that we experience, the physical object. That is something which even advanced quantum physicists have not been able to figure out. There's a thinker who said that if you think you have understood quantum physics, then you have not understood quantum physics. <laughs> so some, some, each model, each model of even quantum physics, it works in its own way. And we use it, that model for the purpose that it serves. So why I'm talking about this is the Shat Chakra model is a particular way of looking at the world, looking at the human body. And we talk about consciousness as rising from one level to another level to another level. Now, the, um, the not so much consciousness, it is more like the seat of consciousness, which is the, the energy center of the body, which rises upwards. So essentially, this correlates with the elevation of the consciousness from the physical level to the spiritual level. The higher the energy center of the body, the higher is the elevation of the consciousness also. Now, this elevation of consciousness can happen through the process of um, uh, through various processes and essentially when the consciousness comes to the level of the Brahma Randra that is called so when it comes to that level from there one goes upwards now how far up one will go one will, that from there one will make significant spiritual evolution but whether the evolution will attain culmination or not that depends on the level of our desires if we still have a desire with this higher consciousness, I would like to enjoy material pleasures better. Then we will return to the physical level of reality to enjoy it again. But if we want to enjoy eternal life at a spiritual level, then we get liberated. So the, uh, the important thing is not just the, the soul's the energy center entering into the uh, head level. It is the overall purpose of life. It is overall understanding of what I want to achieve in my life. We may our consciousness may be raised to a high level in the sense that energy center is high up, but we may be looking for looking still for mundane things. It says that oh, a vulture flies high in the sky, but from there it is looking down at corpses. So it has risen high, but its conception of life has not really changed. For, of course, in the vulture's body, it is looking for food itself and its food is corpses. But the vulture is used as an example to illustrate that going high doesn't necessarily lead to elevation of one's purpose. So through the mechanical system of uh, raising of chakras, we can come to a higher level of consciousness. But specifically, where we will go will depend on what the purpose of our life is. So there are various systems of yoga. The process of bhakti yoga focuses not so much on mechanically raising the chakras but on raising the purpose of life itself. So when we understand that our purpose is to love the Supreme and to lovingly unite with the Supreme ultimately and to lovingly serve the Supreme in this world, that elevation of the purpose automatically leads to the elevation of the consciousness. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Hare Krishna. Okay. So I thank all of you for your enthusiastic participation both in the talk as well as in the question answers. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you.